Guns for General Washington. Chapter 20. The Chasm. From an upper window at headquarters, Washington could see Howe's troop ships in the harbor. For a while, he studied them with his telescope, then closed the glass and went downstairs. Outside his office door, the sentry snapped to attention. Washington took note of the man's smart appearance and drew comfort from it. Yes, the Continental Army was making progress. It was beginning to look like a real fighting force, but they still needed artillery in order to fight. At his desk, Washington stared at the calendar and frowned. Time was running out. From his spies in Boston, he knew that the British reinforcements weren't top-grade troops, but there were quite a lot of them. Enough now for Howe to launch his attack. The commander drummed his fingers on the desk. Where in blazes was Knox with his cannon? How much longer could they wait? Taking a fresh sheet of paper, he began a note to General Schuler in Albany. He mentioned the enemy's reinforcements, which worried him. Then he confided, I am in hopes that Colonel Knox will arrive with the artillery in a few days. It is much needed. The general would have been even more worried if he knew that while he sat writing, Henry and his men were facing another crisis. The convoy had fought its way over the hills, past the mountain hamlet of Otis and the village of Blanford. Their next goal was Westfield on the east slope of the Berkshire Range. From Westfield, the path would be easier, but right now they were on the rim of a steep chasm that dropped straight down for hundreds of feet. The travelers were at a dead halt. They'd met up with bad terrain before, but never anything this dangerous. Standing at the edge, looking over, the drivers shook their head and grumbled to each other. Finally, an old-timer named Thorne spoke up. Taint any way to get down this cliff, Colonel. No, sir. Not a man among us says it can be done. Henry frowned. I know it's bad but the ridge runs south clear into Connecticut. There's no way around for miles. We'll have to take a chance. Thorne grunted. All of us are strong for the cause, Colonel, but we didn't sign on for suicide. Another driver chimed in. Just getting the animals down is nigh impossible, and if a load ever broke loose, ah, there'd be blue ruin for sure. The argument went back and forth for almost three hours. Henry coaxed and pleaded, but the men wouldn't budge. Will began to think that the mission was doomed. All their work had been for nothing. But the colonel refused to quit, and finally his stubbornness, plus some practical new ideas from Will, saved the day. The men agreed at last to tackle the chasm, though few of them expected to succeed. William's plan for action matched the one they'd used before, but this time, he added many safeguards. The animals were unhitched, then they were led sliding and slipping down a steep incline. Meanwhile, the vehicles were rigged with heavy ropes which were looped around big trees. Drag chains and guy ropes were added to help the crew steady the load as they went down. Now under the colonel's sharp eye, each gun was lowered little by little. Every 50 feet, fat logs were wedged under its wheels and runners to hold the loads in place. Then the men ran ahead and shifted the heavy ropes to trees farther down the slope. The tricky process was then repeated. J.P. Becker, working alongside the older hands, kept an eye on his hero, Will. In spite of his bad knee, the colonel's brother was everywhere, limping along the ridge, giving orders, testing ropes, making sure that every gun moved safely. The troopers and drivers, remembering the runaway cannon, worked hard and took no foolish chances. There were a few snags and tense moments, but no accidents. As the long hours passed, the men's confidence grew, and even Thorne had to admit that the colonel had been right. They were beating the chasm. By nightfall, the whole artillery train was safely at the foot of the great hill. Not a single gun had been lost, nor a man injured. And at that point, Henry called a halt. I'm right proud of us all, he said to the crew. 
Let's eat supper and get a night's rest. It was one decision over which there were no arguments. And we'll read chapter 21 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.